Good evening and welcome to this, the January 24th edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. My name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy and I'm the founder and executive director of the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. And I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please pardon our tardy start uh, to the office party. We're dealing with a few uh, technical difficulties, but we're back on track and ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you all a bit of information about the center and then a quick disclaimer, and then we will get into the questions that have been submitted by our community. So the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness was founded in 2021 with quite an ambitious vision for all college and career school students in the state of Maryland. And that's that they're able to achieve these six pillars of collegiate financial wellness. Those are being credit worthy, ready, resilient, empowered, successful, and thriving. You can learn more about the vision and the mission of the center, which we refer to as McFew for short, by visiting us online at mccfw.org. And if you found our information useful, please do leave a review on Facebook or um, engage with us with comments on YouTube or Facebook as well. And um, if you feel so inclined, you can always make a donation to make sure that programs like Office Hours remain free and available to student loan borrowers who have an internet connection. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I wanna give a quick disclaimer before we get into the questions that have been submitted by our community um, since our, the last time we got together on January the 10th, and that is that Office Hours is presented for informational purposes only. The information presented during our broadcast does not constitute personal, legal, or financial advice. As always, we do the best to give you the most up-to-date information from reliable sources, but things change and they've been changing pretty quickly um, during these past couple of years and even the past couple of weeks. So like I said, we do our best to give you the most up-to-date accurate information, but truly to make an informed decision, you wanna make sure that you have a solid accounting of your student loans and take into account factors like um, your personal uh, preference for risk, your um, household income, the way you file your taxes, all of those things go into your selection of the best strategy to help you get to that zero balance. All right, so I wanted to share some updates um, before we get into the questions. The first one is that we have several more public service loan forgiveness victories. We've had a few uh, educators from Baltimore City Public Schools who have come back and shown us their congratulations letters. I know one of them was for about 66,000, another one was for 60,000. We had another one that was around $109,000. And this is for educators who have been working in the school system for way more than 10 years. They've been in repayment. They've done exactly what they're supposed to do. And um, they work for this. And finally, PSLF worked for them. So I just wanna say congratulations to everyone who has um, experienced those victories that they have earned by way of their dedication um, in their careers in the field of public service. And I just wanna pause for a moment and say hi to my uncle who's joining us this evening. I appreciate you being here. Um, our next announcement is that office hours, we're moving. We've been hosting office hours for the most part at 7 p.m. Eastern time on the uh, second and fourth Wednesdays of the month since we started this back in December of 2021. But, you know, there are not a lot of people that are online in the evening. So we're going to try something new and move it to the lunch hour to see if that's more convenient for people. Um, we know that the time after work is precious and um, we're hoping that the move to the noon day can help more people tune in, perhaps while they're at work. And we're especially thinking of our colleagues that are at higher education institutions. We'll still have the videos uploaded and annotated on YouTube so you can still get to the content. We're just shifting the time of the live broadcast. Um, next on the list is that today we had the pleasure of hosting a student loan policy roundtable at Morgan State University in partnership with the Student Borrower Protection Center and the Cash Campaign of Maryland. We had a really great time and we had individuals who were there um, from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, uh, the Office of the Attorney General, um, the Maryland Independent College and University Association. Like we just had a very good crowd of um, some really diverse opinions. Also, I can't forget the NAACP as well as some of the students who are representing the chapter at Morgan State University. And we just had a very candid discussion 
about what's going on in the space of student loans and how we can work together um, to make sure that policies are being implemented that protect borrowers. I also want to give a shout out to the Baltimore Teachers Union who had a representative there. So we're looking forward to continued work with partners and members of the community so that we can keep on doing the work that we do with individuals, but also go about affecting policy changes that have a chance to impact more people than we can touch directly. Um, the last update is that I have a course uh, coming up with the University of Maryland School of Social Work. It's going to be offered on February 28th and February 29th. It's um, a half day on each of those days. And that course is designed to help people who are um, thinking about financial coaching or are already financial coaches and they want to help their clients utilize um, student loan coaching as a way to improve their uh, financial well-being and, and help people who might be struggling. So if you're interested in learning how student loans work, um, how to take an inventory of student loans, how to explore eligibility for benefits, how to apply for those benefits, then I encourage you take a look at the class. You can find it online at the University of Maryland. This is the Baltimore campus, the graduate professional um, institution. It's UMB. And if you go to the website and look at the School of Social Work, uh, their CPE unit is responsible for this continuing education course. The course uh, costs $130, which I've got to say, I think is a bargain for the amount of information <laughs> that you're going to get. But uh, if you're interested in learning more about this space and potentially helping other people navigate their student loans, then I encourage you to join the course on February 28th and 29th. It's all virtual. So I um, mean, we provide the course materials. So if you're interested, please do take a look and I hope to see many of you there. All right. So Let's get into some of the questions that have come in from our community tonight. The first question is, should I switch from IBR to SAVE? My current payment is zero. Uh, IBR stands for income-based repayment. Now, both income-based repayment and SAVE are income-driven repayment plans. So they're based on your income already, but there are some differences between the two plans that might um, lead one to say, you know what, even though my payment is zero in IBR, perhaps I should switch to save. So on the next slide, you'll see the answer or some of the considerations that went into forming this answer. So the first thing that I thought about was affordability because this borrower made it a point to say, my current payment is zero. And like many people, if your current payment is zero, you don't wanna see that change. <laughs> the good thing is that um, if you were going from IBR to save and your payment is zero on IBR, then your payment should be zero on save. The only time um, that it would not be is if your income increased significantly since the last time that you certified your income. And if that new income was much higher, then it's possible that you could end up seeing your payment go up. But SAVE is a more affordable plan than IBR. So I wouldn't expect that to happen. But in terms of affordability, if your payment is already zero, then there's no urgent need to switch because you can't get any lower than zero. But the other thing that's uh, more pressing is the prospect of cancellation. I, I don't know if all of you heard, but the Biden administration has basically sped up the timeline for implementing the cancellation that's offered by way of SAVE. And that cancellation specifically applies to people who have uh, borrowed originally less than $12,000. And those who will see the most immediate benefit are those who have borrowed $12,000 or less, but have also been in repayment for more than 10 years. So basically this form of relief is looking at people who borrowed a relatively low amount, and I say relatively low because most of the people that we deal with um, at the center usually owe like at least seventy or eighty thousand dollars. Many owe much more than that. So this is for people who have borrowed relatively smaller balances, but have been in repayment for at least ten years and still owe on those balances. So with Save, like I mentioned, they're speeding up the process beginning next month they're actually set to start canceling those balances for borrowers who took out originally $12,000 or less in principal and have been in repayment for more than 10 years. To get this benefit, you must be enrolled and saved. So to this borrower, if you've been in repayment for a while, you borrowed a relatively low amount, then the prospect of that early cancellation might be enough to make you say, you know what, even though my payment will be zero either way, I think I will make the switch from IBR to SAVE. Other things to consider, SAVE has an interest subsidy that income-based repayment does not have. 
through the save repayment plan. If your income driven uh, payment each month is not large enough to cover the interest that's accruing on your balance each month, then the federal government will step in and take care of that interest. And for some people, especially those who have higher balances relative to their incomes, this uh, could really be helpful because if you have, for example, this borrower here, a payment of zero, that means that you're not paying anything on the student loan each month. And if you're not paying anything toward a loan balance, that means the balance is going to continue to rise. If you were enrolled in SAVE and your required payment is zero, you would continue to not make payments, but that accrued interest, even though it accrues, it would be covered by the federal government. So you would no longer see your balance continuing to rise, even as you're in repayment, you know, month after month and year after year. Um, I also wanted to add the consideration of public service loan forgiveness, because I know for a fact that this borrower is pursuing PSLF. Now with PSLF, both save and income-based repayment are qualifying repayment plans because they're both income-driven and all income-driven repayment plans qualify toward PSLF. So for PSLF, it doesn't matter. Um, it really doesn't matter if you're getting the interest subsidy because PSLF will cancel the entire remaining balance, principal and interest. However, um, I really think people should pay attention to the cancellation provision within SAVE, especially for those who have lower original balances, because that uh, prospect of forgiveness beginning next month might be enough for you to say, you know what, I think I am going to go from IBR to SAVE. Even though the payment should still remain zero, there is a possibility that if you have had the loans for more than 10 years and you borrow less than 12000 uh, to begin with, you could be one of those people who has their debt cleared next month. So that was a great question. All right, let's move on to our next question. The next question has to do with save. And the question is, how are they figuring out if I borrow $12,000 or less? This is a great question because sometimes people look at their loans and say, well, I have one loan that was $6,000 or one loan that was $5,000 because those loans were less than $12,000. Uh, by themselves? Uh, does that mean that those debts can be uh, forgiven? And the answer is no. They're looking at the original principal balance as borrowed. So even if you took out individual loans that were less than $12,000 each, that does not mean that those loans are going to be forgiven by way of this 10-year provision within SAVE. What they're looking at is the original principal balance in total. So if you look at all the student loans that you borrowed and those loans are less than $12,000 or were less than $12,000 in principal, then that would mean that balance qualifies to be considered for this particular uh, cancellation option. But you need to be enrolled in SAVE for that forgiveness to happen. So again, the $12,000 threshold is based on the original principal balance of of the loans. And if you want to know how to find your original principal balance, the best place to go is studentaid.gov. You will need your FSA ID. You can log in. And after you get past all the two-step verification and co confirming that they have your phone number and your email address and all that stuff, you'll get to the dashboard. Right now, the dashboard has like a um, kind of a banner at the top of it that has to do with the FAFSA. But if you're not interested in that, just ignore that. You're going to look for the blue um, button that says view details. If you click that detail button, it's going to take you to a screen that shows you, again, the dashboard components, as well as a loan type section. And then at the very bottom, you'll come across the loan breakdown. Within that loan breakdown, your loans are grouped by servicers. So if you see multiple servicers there, then you'll see um, the individual loans for that servicer once you click to expand the detail for the servicer. From there, you want to look at the individual loans. You can see so many details there, the disbursement dates, the original amounts, your repayment progress, the repayment plan that you're enrolled in. But the key um, that this person is concerned about is how to figure out if they borrowed $12,000 or less. So um, just to reiterate the answer to that question, the $12,000 is based on the original overall principal balance. So if you borrowed more than $12,000, then this 10-year provision through SAVE would not be for you, but that doesn't mean the cancellation is completely off the table. It just might take longer. All right, let's move on to the next question. And that question is, do I need to consolidate 
and apply for IDR to receive forgiveness? I feel like just about all of these questions, um, my answer is it depends because <laughs> that's the truth. Um, it really does depend on a number of factors. So to answer this question, I needed a lot more um, in detail. So I want to share some of the background that the borrower shared with us. First, is that the borrower has seven Department of Education loans that are currently serviced by AidVantage uh, with original balances ranging from $1,000 to $6,000. Uh, all of the loans have an open account date for at least 12, excuse me, at least 11 years ago. And finally, two private loans are held by the borrower from Navient. And this borrower wants to know also if those two private loans from Navient could be consolidated um, to get on track for forgiveness through uh, income-driven repayment. So this was a loaded question. So I'm going to kind of go about answering it in, in a few phases. So the first phase has to do with the types of loans that the borrower has. And this is really how I would recommend approaching all questions that are related to student loan forgiveness or cancellation. Your access to benefits depends on your loan types. So the first thing that you really need to do to get a true picture of you know, what your options are for cancellation or forgiveness, that is to confirm the types of loans you have. The best way to do that is to go to studentaid.gov and again, look at that dashboard. Now in this person's case, there are two things we need to see. The first one is we wanna make sure that those seven loans are gonna be included in the IDR adjustment. If those loans are direct or held by the Department of Education, then they're on track already to get a payment count. Uh, can we back up just a little bit? <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, we wanna confirm that those loans are direct or held by the Department of Education. The second thing we wanna do, even though the borrower in their question said that they have two private Navient loans, I just wanna make sure that those loans are truly private versus being privately held. So when you go into studentaid.gov, that's gonna allow us to confirm two things. The first thing is that the seven loans are direct. The second thing is whether or not the Navient loans can be included um, and benefit from IDR cancellation. So that's what we're looking for. To verify this, you wanna go into studentaid.gov, take a look at that dashboard and look at the balance. If the balance matches the sum of the outstanding balances on the seven aid vantage loans, then you know that the Navient loans are truly private. But on the other hand, if the balance you see is the sum of all nine loans, that lets you know right away that the aid vantage loans qualify, but the Navient loans qualify as well. Another way to do this would be to go on the dashboard go to the view detail screen and look at the breakdown again so that you can see if Navient is listed there. Sometimes things are tricky when it comes to Navient because Navient services federal student loans, but Navient also has truly private loans. So some people that have loans from Navient think that their loans are private, but it turns out the loans are actually privately held federal student loans. So all of that to say, if you go inside of studentaid.gov and you can see the Navient loans there, then yes, that means the loans are federal student loans and they could get on track to benefit from IDR cancellation. So let's move to the next um, part of the answer to this question. Okay, again, this is about the difference between private student loans and privately held student loans. If these Navient loans are truly private, that means that Navient is the lender. And if any entity other than the federal government um, is the true lender, that means that these loans are not going to be eligible for save the IDR adjustment or any other federal student loan benefits because the loan came uh, from somewhere outside of the Department of Education. On the other hand, with privately held student loans, there is hope when it comes to uh, IDR cancellation. If those Navient loans are within studentaid.gov, then to answer the second part of this borrower's question, yes, you can consolidate them with the aid vantage loans to get all of the loans on track for cancellation through uh, SAVE or through the IDR adjustment. And when you consolidate them all together before that April 30th, 2024 deadline, the entire consolidation portfolio will have uh, its payment count attached to the loan in the portfolio that had the most history. So if these loans are more than 11 years old, whichever loan has the most history, in that portfolio, once the loans are combined, that individual loan is gonna carry the rest of that debt. Just wanna give a quick reminder here. 
If your loans are federal and you choose to consolidate them with a private lender, you will lose access to all federal student loan benefits, including um, these income-driven repayment plans, the cancellation that they provide, public service loan forgiveness, and a host of other programs. So if you are going to consolidate your loans, please make sure that you are consolidating through studentaid.gov. You're not consolidating with a bank or any other company um, because they're private lenders. Once you take federal student loans and consolidate them with a private lender, you lose access to everything. So when we talk about consolidation, I just want to make sure that everyone understands this is consolidation through the federal government. And that application is online at studentaid.gov. All right. There's one more piece of this um, question that I wanted to get into, and that had to deal with timing. So with SAVE, the announcement that came out uh, within the past two weeks was specifically about people who originally borrowed $12,000 or less and have been in repayment for at least 10 years. But if you borrowed more than $12,000, there's still a possibility that SAVE might provide some relief for you faster than the typical 20 or 25 years that's required um, for income-driven repayment plans in general. So the, the floor kind of starts at $12,000, but for every additional $1,000 that you borrowed, one more year is added on to that cancellation milestone. So with 12,000 or less, you could get cancellation after 10 years. With 13,000 or less than 13,000, it would take you 11 years. 14,000 would take you 12 years. And we keep going up and up and up until we get to a place where we've reached that 20 or 25 years which are both the normal requirements for cancellation under income driven repayment plans. So not only does SAVE have the interest subsidy, but SAVE also provides a faster pathway to loan forgiveness for people who have those relatively low um, original principal balances and have been in repayment for at least 10 years. So for this particular borrower, I want to thank you for this question and also thank you for the level of detail you provided in submitting this question because it's uh, was really um, helpful for me in crafting an answer to the question. The answer for this particular borrower, again, is to know your loan types. First thing we want to do is make sure those loans are direct. And for the loans that you think are private, we want to make sure they're truly private. But if you see them in studentaid.gov, that means they're not private. And you can get all of these loans on track to benefit from the IDR adjustment by consolidating through studentaid.gov. Great question. All right, let's move on to the next question. And that question is, I just consolidated. Do I need to keep making payments? And thankfully, the answer to this question is much easier. <laughs> that answer is, yes, you should continue to make payments on the existing loans until you hear otherwise from your servicer. Now, in the past few months, what we have seen is servicers um, placing the loans into a forbearance while the consolidation uh, application is processing, but I'm, I don't think that that always happens. So the advice that I give is we want the loans to stay in good standing. So when you consolidate, your older loans are going to be paid off and a new loan is going to be originated. That new loan is going to have its own repayment plan, its own repayment schedule, but you don't want to um, miss payments on your existing loans, I, or at least for me personally, I would want to remain in good standing by making payments on the existing loans until those loans have been paid off and the new loan has been originated. And again, sometimes you might see the loans go into a forbearance after shortly after you submit a consolidation application. But if you don't um, hear that it's time to stop making payments, then I would encourage you to, to make your payments as promised. All right, next question. Question is about consolidation again. I consolidated for PSLF, but I don't see the forgiveness. Is there something else I need to do? And this is a great question because sometimes um, there's a, a misconception that all you have to do is complete these applications and then boom, you know, like magic, everything's going to disappear. But it's really not like that. This is a process that at a minimum, can take um, with consolidation included probably three months at the very fastest from what I've seen so far. So for this particular borrower, yes, there's something else to do. And that would be to wait because this is a complex process. 
When you consolidate, your existing loans have to be paid off. And after those loans are paid off, a new loan has to be originated. And then that new loan is dispersed. Um, this borrower, I also know, submitted their PSLF application for all of their employers. So these are two different processes kind of happening at the same time. One is the consolidation application. The other is the evaluation of the employment um, as it pertains to public service loan forgiveness. So after the consolidation loan goes through, the servicer is going to conduct a payment count. They're going to look at how many payments qualify for PSLF because of your employment and how many payments are eligible, meaning they could count toward PSLF if there's employment to match them. The first payment count after a consolidation is always scares people, even though we tell them up front, hey, expect your first payment count to be super low. There's just something jarring about knowing that you've been in repayment for like 15 years and then getting a payment count that says you've got two months, you know, toward the 120 months that you need. But that's a part of the process. So if you receive that super low single digit qualifying payment count, that means the process is happening the way that it's supposed to, because that first payment count only considers the history of the consolidation loan. And if you just consolidated, there's not much history to consider. It's probably two months at most. So if you see a single digit payment count, that is not a need to worry. On the other hand, it lets you know the process is moving forward as it has for everyone else. Then usually three to five weeks late later, we see payment count number two. And sometimes it takes payment count number three or number four for them to fully account for all of your employment history. So the second payment count is where they've started to review your pre-consolidation loan history. That means going back and looking at the repayment history of all of the loans that are wrapped up into that consolidation loan. And when they consider all of that history, whichever loan in the portfolio has the greatest amount of history, that history is going to be used to calculate your qualifying payment count. So if you go through the consolidation, you get payment count number one and you get payment count number two. For some people, payment count number two is going to show that they're already at 120 qualifying payments or higher. And when you get to 120 qualifying payments, that means that you have met the requirements for public service loan forgiveness and the remaining balance of your debt on those loans should be discharged. But another um, kind of popular misconception is that once you reach 120, the, the discharge is automatic. That's not the case. Sometimes we see people who have you know, 125 or 188, saw that um, not too long ago, someone who had 188 qualifying payments, but the loans had not been forgiven yet. It's not like a, you know, you get to 120 on a meter and then that automatically kicks in the forgiveness approval and the discharge. I don't know exactly how the process works behind the scenes, but I do know it's not automatic. So if you do see a qualifying payment count of more than 120 and nothing has happened immediately, do not be alarmed. It just means that there's some extra time that's needed to process. Now, if you go months, you know, with seeing a count of more than 120 payments and you're still being asked to make payments, then I would definitely reach out to Mohila and ask them what's going on. Because usually, or at least as of late for the people that we've seen that are over 120, their loans are placed into an administrative forbearance, meaning that they don't have to make payments because the discharge is being uh, worked on or uh, they're getting ready to send the congratulations that are you've you know, met the requirements of the PSLF program. So at the core of this is just remember, if you're applying for PSLF and you have those older ineligible loans, or even if your loans are eligible and you're consolidating them to get the most credit toward PSLF, nothing with this process is going to happen overnight. It takes employment verification. If you consolidate it, it takes that application being approved, process, the loans being paid off, new loans dispersed, history being considered. There are several steps to this. So do not expect for it to happen overnight. You're looking at a few months at minimum. For some people, it's taken almost a year to get all of this sorted out. But as of late, we have not seen many people um, with experiences that lag that long. So just hang in there. If you know you've uh, submitted all of your employment and that employment has been verified, it's just a matter of the consolidation loan dispersing and you going through this cycle of payment count number one, two, and so on. All right, let's move on to the next question. That is, 
The servicer is giving me the runaround when I call about my PSLF application. Can you tell me what's going on? And this is an actual question <laughs> that, that came up late last week. And um, answer is, I can't really tell you what's going on. I, I can tell you some places to go so that you might have a more accurate picture of what's happening behind the scenes. And this is what happened last Friday night. So um, I was speaking with the borrower who was frustrated because he called in, you know, couldn't really get an update. And one update I mentioned that he was told that only a couple of the loans were going to be forgiven. The rest of them could not because they were the wrong type. And it was just uh, kind of confusing because we had already been through examining the loan types, seeing that they were all direct, knowing they didn't need to be consolidated and knowing that they all had more than 120 months, months of history, both for repayment and employment. So instead of, you know, suggesting, you know, wait till Monday morning and call, I suggested log into the website, go to mohila.com and let's take a look at your message center. And surely enough, we went to the message center and there were two messages in there and the subject was important account information. Clicked on the first letter and it was the congratulations letter. You have met the requirements for public service loan forgiveness. Your loans have been forgiven. The second page of that letter listed all of the loans with the balances. And I think it even had a, a small refund because there had been overpayment. So in this case, the borrower had called in and I don't know exactly when he called. So this could have been a couple of weeks ago, but either way, called in, was not satisfied with the answer he was receiving, but had not gone to the website. And apparently he had signed up for electronic communications. So when you sign up for electronic communications, you have to check the message center because that's where they're sending those communications. And the subject was not congratulations or you've been approved for PSLF. It was important account information. And there was more than one letter with that same subject. So just a few tips for people who uh, have applied for PSLF and are kind of wondering what's going on. To find your payment count, you want to go to mohila.com and then on that kind of navy bluish uh, navigation bar across the top, you want to click on PSLF and take a look at that uh, drop down menu and see if the payment tracker is visible. If the payment tracker is visible, then you can see your qualifying payment count. And if you'd look, like to look at a month by month breakdown of it, you can click show payment summary and you'll be able to see all the months that have um, that are eligible and have employment that's already been verified. Um, speaking of employment, if you want to know whether your employment verifications are up to date, you can also go to the payment tracker and there's a tab in there. And forgive me, I can't remember right now if it says employment or employers, but either way, there are four uh, lighter blue tabs and it's the last one on the right. If you click on that tab, you can see a list of your employers as well as the dates for which those employers have been certified. Lastly, if you sent in an application and you haven't heard anything, um, if the payment tracker is not yet available on your uh, mohila.com account yet, there is an option for you to click PSLF and then select PSLF form status. They will ask you to enter some personally identifying information. And based on that information, they'll be able to pull your records and let you know if the form has been received, if it's processed, if it was rejected, if it was a duplicate. All of that stuff can be found by visiting PSLF form status. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, so this question is actually a question that came up for our January 10th edition of Office Hours. And when I went back to revisit it, I realized that I did not fully answer the question. So I wanna make sure that I go through this question step-by-step step and answer everything that the bar were asked. So. The question is, I'm in graduate school and I have a disbursement coming in January. Can I consolidate while in school for the IDR adjustment? This is kind of a lengthy answer because I want to go through this um, step by step. So the first part of this answer is just the background. Um, this borrower has undergraduate and graduate loans with a gap in between studies. The reason the borrower is interested in consolidating is because during that gap, the undergraduate school loans were in repayment. And by consolidating during this special period uh, before April 30th of this year, the graduate loans that have not been in repayment can receive credit for the time that the undergraduate loans were in repayment. So this person wants to know, can I put these loans together to take advantage of the adjustment? To answer that question, we need to know what type of loans the borrower has taken out for graduate school. And that's the next bullet point. This borrower has taken out direct unsubsidized loans. The other part of the question the borrower asked was, 
what if the IDR adjustment deadline is extended again? Right now, the deadline is set at April 30th. What if it gets extended to June 30th or October? Or just what if it moves um, further out than April 30th of 2024? So now I'm going to um, dive into the answer and you'll see how these nuances affect the answer to the question. So graduate school loans are unsubsidized. Well, all of them are unsubsidized, but the particular loan type that this person took out is a direct unsubsidized loan. Direct unsubsidized loans have a mandatory in-school status. So as long as you're enrolled at least half time in school, your school is basically reporting you to a clearinghouse to say that you are in school at least half time. And based on that enrollment, your loans are in an in-school status. You can't opt out of the in-school status. So as long as you're in school, those loans will be in an in-school status. So for this particular borrower, the disbursement is coming in January. The borrower is in school. You can't consolidate a loan that's in an in-school status. So um, with this particular type of loan at this particular time, no, you would not be able to consolidate these graduate school loans in order to get credit toward the IDR adjustment. Now, this is assuming that the deadline remains at April 30th because this person is enrolled in the spring semester and the spring semester will not be over by April 30th. But if the deadline is extended beyond April 30th and beyond the date that this person completes their program, they're graduating in the spring. So if they graduate in May, the loans will enter a grace period right after that. Once the loans have entered the grace period, the borrower could opt out of the grace period and consolidate the loans to get them all on the same timeline for the IDR adjustment. But that's only if the deadline is extended beyond the date that those loans remain in, in school status. So if we do see, let's say an extension to July 1st, then this borrower would be able to take advantage of the situation because they could opt out of the grace period, combine those loans, and then the graduate school loans get credit for the same amount of time as the undergraduate loans have been in repayment. Because this person has direct unsubsidized loans, uh, consolidating by April 30th would not be an option because the in-school status is there. However, if the person had graduate plus loans, with grad plus loans, they don't have an in-school status. They have an in-school deferment, and that in-school deferment is optional. But um, it's good to note here, it's applied automatically through the clearinghouse, just like the in-school status. Once you've enrolled half-time, it's reported to the clearinghouse, and that half-time enrollment or more triggers your loans going into an in-school status or an in-school deferment. But if you have graduate plus loans, you can contact the servicer and you can opt out of that in-school deferment, which means that the loans would go into payment immediately. So if this borrower had taken out plus loans instead of a direct unsubsidized loan, then they would have the option to opt out of the in-school deferment, consolidate those loans and get the graduate school loans sped up to the pace of forgiveness for the undergraduate loans. Now, um, I know that some people, uh, some perhaps uh, financial aid savvy people might say, well, could the person um, give back or try to return the direct unsubsidized loan and take out a grad plus loan instead? Uh, if you were a student thinking about that, you know, based on this answer, I, I would definitely uh, have a talk with your financial aid administrator um, about your options because loan returns are um, a thing that people can do. I don't know how that would work in terms of the timing of the fall disbursement, but um, the bottom line here is that when you have a direct unsubsidized loan for graduate school, you cannot opt out of the in-school status as long as you have that enrollment. With Grad Plus loans, it's an in-school deferment and you can opt out of it. So um, I also want to say that we haven't been given any indication that the deadline is going to be extended beyond April 30th, but the borrower was just looking at you know, the past. The deadline has been extended multiple times and uh, they just wanted to know, how does this look for me if the deadline is April 30th versus July 1, October 1, et cetera? So great question with a lot of nuances. All right, I think, um, oops, 
had a little error there. That's all right. That's my fault. All right. We can move on. I think that might have been the last question. I'm not sure. Let's go forward a bit. Oh, there we go. So that was the last question. All right. So I just want to um, close out by sharing some resources specifically for Marylanders. Maryland is a state that has a student loan ombudsman and the student loan ombudsman can assist you with student loan servicer problems that include failure by the servicer to communicate with a borrower, errors in credit, um, crediting principal and interest payments, misapplied payments, inaccurate interest rate calculations, billing errors, loan consolidations or modification errors, and or inappropriate collection activity or tactics. So the picture that you see is actually a screenshot of the website for the student loan ombudsman, which is um, housed within Maryland's Department of Labor. And you can take a look um, at the uh, banner streaming at the bottom, which shows you the web address for the Maryland Student Loan Ombudsman. And we'll make sure that we drop that in the chat too. So that if you'd like to file a complaint at the state level, you can do that. Um, you also have the option to file a complaint with the Consumer Protection, Financial Protection Bureau, their consumerfinance.gov. Also, the Department of Education has uh, an ombudsman. They're very specific about the types of problems that they address. So you can find that information online at studentaid.gov. But the point is to let you know you have options to advocate for yourself. And if you feel that um, that advocacy needs to include a formal complaint, you have options at both the state and the federal level. All right, so I think that we are about ready to wrap this up. I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us for another edition of Office Hours. It has been my pleasure to, to be here with you this evening. I want to encourage you to stay in touch with us. You can visit us online at mccfw.org. You can visit the website, learn more about our programs. And also, if you'd like to support, just click on the support page and you can make a donation. You can also leave a testimonial. Just um, so your support can come in so many ways that can be helpful to us. If you like the content, please do engage with us online. Uh, this video will soon be on our YouTube channel. We are at the MCCFW on YouTube, Facebook, um, X the platform formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. So please do make sure that you connect with us online. We are always ready to engage. And um, I want to check the comments just to see if we have any other questions before we hop off. Let's see. Nope. I don't see any. So I want to thank you again for joining us tonight for another edition of Office Hours. As always, my name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy. I'm the founder and executive director of the center. And I just want to thank you again so much for your engagement until we get together next month. Remember, at noon instead of 7 p.m., I just uh, wish you well and take care. Bye bye.